Добрый день, дорогие коллеги, участники пятой международной конференции. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, participants in the fifth anniversary of the Magic of Innovation Conference at Himo. Yesterday and in the morning today, we had a wonderful opportunity uh, to work closely with one another, very constructively, uh, and we exchanged our uh, research ideas. Now, allow me to open our uh, concluding session, but before I give the floor uh, to the first presenter, I would like to remind you that both at the site of the conference and on the uh, MGIMO YouTube channel, there is a reference, a link, through which you can ask the speaker a question. And I would also remind our speakers that according to the time limits approved, we have from 30 to 35 minutes for making their presentation and then about 10 or 15 minutes for questions and answers. So let us start with the first presenter, um, uh, Irina Zekova, PhD in linguistics, uh, who is a researcher at the um, Institute of Linguistics of the Russian Academy of Sciences. She is interested, she has a, a broad uh, field of scientific and research interest, uh, interests, uh, including the linguistic creativity, which is very much spoken about. And today's uh, presentation she is going to make is uh, to cinematic uh poetics and uh, linguistic creativity uh good afternoon dear participants of the conference i'm glad to um, address you at this conference which is uh distinguished by a very high level of uh scientific uh exchange uh of different experts in interdisciplinary um, research fields and in linguistics, lexicology, stylistics, so you name them. So I'm going to speak about the multidimensional nature of linguistic creativity in the poetics of a cinematic discourse. Can you see my slides? Yes, uh, thank you. We can see everything and uh, hear you. Uh, the uh, age of high technologies changes the landscape of uh, linguistic of the linguistic science, and it makes it necessary to work on new approaches to uh, studying uh, the linguistic uh, discourse and the linguistic creativity. And uh, my research is. Uh, uh, dealing with cinematic discourse. One of the most relevant issues uh, now is uh, to study the specific features of constructing a poly coded structure of a uh, cinematograph, a cinematographic film and the interrelation uh, of different modalities in its creation. And language is one of the important uh, means in creating this. And I would like to quote uh, Gilles Deleuze, a very well-known French philosopher and theoretician, who said in one of his um, um, books, he wrote, one of the principal aims of cinema uh, is to film speech. This uh, maxim by Gilles Deleuze introduces us to uh, a very important field in the cinematic art. What is the role of the word in creating a, a cinematography uh, a creation, a film? And uh, it was asked at the beginning of the century, uh, which was connected with uh, the burgeoning art of cinematography. And of course, at first cinema, the cinema was uh, silent and then it all changed. One of the uh, theoreticians who contributed to 
uh, understanding the essence of this process uh, was the book. Uh, well, uh, one of the books which contributed to this process was the poetics of the cinema. And the, you see a number of uh, authors of the articles who that were published in this book. And in their articles, they analyzed uh, the system of new uh, poetics of the cinema and the possibility of creating a multi-dimensional, multi-modal uh, construction of the uh, film. And this book became uh, the foundation for uh, an autonomous uh, track, uh, which uh, became, uh, received the name, The Poetics of the Cinema. Uh, and uh, this phrase is very often used by different theoreticians. And there are many uh, monographs written on this topic. Another important uh, contribution they made was that uh, there was a, a universal understanding of the new art which was the primacy of the poetic over the pragmatic, aesthetic over the communicative, uh, innovative over the traditional, uh, low over the high, uh, nonverbal over the verbal. And later, uh, the verbal factor was also reassessed and its important role in creating uh, a work of art was uh, realized. As Tenyanov said, every mistake of the uh, uh, cinematic poetics uh, is very um, well meaningful. Uh, and when some norms and traditions are infringed upon, then it usually uh, means that they seek to, uh, to um, excite uh, or emotively affect the public uh, and uh, the language creativity, the linguistic creativity, as is an important part of the poetics of the cinema. And uh, this innovative school uh, about which uh, Viktor Shklovsky wrote um, well, they, uh, was very important for him. He analyzed the comic element, the satirical element, the exaggerations and methods, and so on. Uh, it is quite clear that the interest uh, here was not just in the word as such, but also in the creative linguistic potential. The experience which has now been amassed of uh, linguistic creativity is uh, vast. And I'm not going to speak about the uh, research papers that already exist. I will only uh, speak about uh, what is being researched today, the creative potential of the language, of the uh, terminology of different lexes uh, are analyzed. And yesterday, uh, in one of the presentations, uh, of, of phraseology uh, potential in uh, creating cinematic metaphors was discussed. Uh, what is also being researched is the a morphological, syntactical uh, structure, uh, the, the cinematic discourse, uh, a certain typology of uh, innovations in uh, linguistic creativity are researched, whether they are a mistake or a deliberate step that is taken, which uh, revolutionize the language. Uh, we also, uh, what uh, researchers also study is the integrative uh, potential of different uh, parameters. I have already said that culture is changing very rapidly and we see that traditional forms of communication uh, are becoming intermediate very often uh, and uh, they are becoming multi and poly coded. The role of uh, uh, of supplying the uh, discourse with the uh, modern uh, references uh, is also expanding. Uh, uh, well, I have started with the history of the issue 
um, when the um, term the poetics of the cinema was first introduced, uh, because I think it is very important for my topic. One of the um, key notions is the poetics of the cinematic discourse, which we understand as a combination of different artistic principles, uh, techniques, strategies, and means, which are aimed at uh, creating a cinematic uh, discourse as a specific uh, discourse in its nature, that is multimodal, polymodal, polycoded, multi-channel, virtual, uh, which reflects uh, reality, which exists in fictional space and time, and which reflects a certain concept of the world. The next key notion is um, uh, the language norm uh, versus linguistic crea creativity. Uh, and we understand lingua, uh, linguistic creativity as uh, violating or infringing on the uh, language norm. Linguistic creativity is seen as an absolute um, uh, activity which has universal parameters and forms of manifestation, which in any discourse will be recognized and used universal when the language is used uh, in some new innovative format. And also it is uh, uh, this linguistic creativity is conditioned on the uh, discourse, on the discursive elements, on the aims of the discourse, the discourse and the non-standard innovative use of the language uh, is recognized as linguistic creativity. So, uh, sometimes uh, when um, uh, you speak about a different context, which does not have the aim of creating some new perception, uh, it does not play such an innovative role. Now, what are our approaches? Linguistic creativity suggests that we should measure uh, the creativity of uh, the creative potential of the language uh, from the position of creating a verbal system of a cinematic work and uh, the study of the specific features of the creativity of this system. And the second point is studying the creative potential of the language um, from the angle of creating a cinematic uh, metaphor, that is the cinematic uh, trope. Um, I shall uh, dwell a little on both these approaches and I shall tell you about the results of the use of these parameters. The first approach of studying the creative potential of the language in terms of creating a verbal system uh, in a cinematic work uh, suggests that the first method of discursive parametric analysis of linguistic creativity includes corpus annotation, uh, uh, the method uh, is designed to create a scale which determines the level of linguistic creativity of this or that text of the work and also the threshold uh, level of um, linguistic novations which are typical of a certain type of discourse. And the method is based on the multi-level system of parameters of linguistic creativity, which includes three groups of parameters which are interacting between them. The first one is the external parameters or macro discursive parameters, which explicate the interrelation um, uh, and the influence of the external factors on the um, implementation of the creative potential of a language system in discourses, cultural, political, social, uh, technological process, and so on. The second group is internal micro discursive parameters which point to the creative use in discourse of language means of different levels and interdiscursive parameters, the third group, which um, reveals the interrelation between discourses, for example, the cinematic discourse with the advertising, avant-garde, political, and uh, others, uh, which conditions the changes uh, the, uh, the, the, it's, um, in its uh, linguistical, uh, ling lingua creative potential, uh, making it higher or lower. I shall only speak about the second group of parameters, the internal ones. We singled out 
52 micro discursive parameters, which take into account different levels and different aspects of the language, uh, phonological, morphological, word formation, lexical, syntactical, and spelling. Uh, and each of the parameters received a number, a, a digital code. And in the second column, you see how many parameters we um, singled out uh, in each of these levels. And uh, the uh, examples, for example, code 102, which means echoism, uh, sound symbolism, uh, or uh, tw uh, code 203, categorial, um, uh, innovative um, pronoun uh, among the lexical units, phraseological units are singled out among the syntactical ones. For example, 501 stands for elliptical constructions, uh, graphical hybrids uh, under code 605 in um, uh, orthographic um, uh, at the orthographic level, at the spelling level. For uh, deciphering these uh, indicators and indexes more, uh, I would like to show what is meant by the linguistically created parameters at the lexical level. The change of the register of communication, um, formal for informal or territorial code 402, for example, the use of the vernacular, dialectical lexical unit, gender, gender um, determined uh, lexes, uh, the um, change uh, of the professional code, the introduction of a term, the change of a linguistic code, for example, the introduction of a foreign language element, uh, the change in the lingual semiotic code, for example, a uh, gesture can be introduced instead of a word, the expressive, uh, the lexical expressives and emotives, the uh, lexical neologisms and occasionalisms, uh, parad uh, par uh, the paradigm intensity, the use of synonyms, antonyms, among, uh, homonyms and paronyms, uh, the um, multimodality and the um, multiple meanings of the word. All the parameters uh, are categorized in the, in the text of the films and processed with the help of a special program. Uh, the result of which we identify uh, the degree of the activity of the parameters in a certain film. Then uh, the compatibility of every parameter with every verbal system of the film. Uh, then uh, creative and non-creative actualization of the parameters. Fourth, uh, the uh, used uh, lingua creative uh, devices in creating language and no novelties which influence uh, the original nature of the uh, cinema text and as a result uh, we identify uh, the general specificity of uh, the film as a example as a result uh, we can look at the at the comedies which are uh, aimed at uh, the uh, non-conventional use of the language to uh, reach uh, the main pragmatic uh, objective. This is uh, to express uh, the category of uh, uh, comic nature. Let's compare two samples. Uh, each of them consists of uh, the text of five comedies of two different periods. Uh, the comedies of the 1960s and uh, the first category included the Polosatyria, 3 plus 2, Я шагаю по Москве. That is жалобную книгу операции другие приключения Шурика. That's so the sixties, and uh, the second sample included also popular films, the Soviet comedies, "Джентльмены удачи", "Печки лавочки", "Ван Васильевич меняет профессию", "Неисправимый лгун", and "Гараж". Studying uh, the peculiarities of active parameters resulted in the following results, and uh, we see the diagrams, the results on, in the diagram. So as to the language creativity, the least creative is the level of uh, uh, morphology and word formation in the comedies, and uh, most active uh, are the parameters of lexical and stylistic level. So respectively, we view them as uh, the special zones which requires attention. At the next stage of the research, like I uh, mentioned previously, as the parameters uh, do not uh, work 
cocoa by themselves, isolated in an isolated manner. We study the compatibility of the parameters and their uh, correlations. So here we see the result of the analysis of Garash Barizanov and uh, the result of the analysis of the compatibility of the stylistic metaphors uh, comparing with other parameters. Here, we do not have in the table two last level, levels, but we can see from this table that the number and the numerical compatibility is different. Uh, stylistical metaphors have a different compatibility with the phonological, lexical, and other levels. The next stage of, an, of the analysis is uh, distinguishing creative and non-creative phenomena. And here I would like to demonstrate uh, this uh, uh, distinction using the parameter of the change of uh, language creative registers. Uh, this is uh, the lexical uh, parameter of 401 by socio-communicative registers. We understand the social uh, sub-languages of the communicative uh, influence. Uh, the following scale was adopted of so social communicative re uh, registers. Uh, lofty, neutral official, neutral, neutral uh, conversational, non-formal, and uh, uh, substandard. Uh, when uh, we analyzed the, the specifics of changing the registers, uh, we um, uh, start uh, with uh, the change of the register. In our case, uh, the starting the original uh, uh, standard was uh, the neutral con conversational and neutral official. And the change happens either to the uh, upper re registers or lower registers. In studying uh, the change of uh, these registers, this is uh, an indication of changing roles of uh, the participants of the characters and uh, some modifications uh, are uh, explained by the situation and expected aimed primarily at developing uh, the uh, story, the subject. Others uh, are not uh, explained by the situation and are quite unexpected. And uh, the result in the social and uh, communicative uh, disparity. And uh, we uh, connected uh, with the distortion of uh, different roles of the participants changing the format of the discussion when the pragmatic um, goal of the discourse is act actualized. And uh, uh, this is shown in the comic nature of the discourse. The uh, appearance of this uh, disparity shows uh, that the change of uh, registers uh, is intended and is of uh, uh, linguistic nature. The change of the uh, registers uh, with uh, the pragmatic role can be, uh, can be proved by uh, the uh, film Seven Nurses. The, an uh, adolescent was adopted uh, by a team of workers and uh, he invents uh, the history of his childhood uh, while they're traveling by train. Afanasi, uh, who is the main character, says uh, that my childhood uh, and uh, my adolescence were very difficult and uh, much more difficult than uh, with Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy. I looked at, I look at Pasha and remember my father who was also handsome and strong. And, uh, uh, the aim of the discourse uh, arises because uh, um, the main character invents uh, his uh, childhood and also uses uh, the uh, episodes from Tolstoy's novels. Therefore, the um, discourse intensifies, intensifies uh, when he mentions three periods of his life. And uh, the peak is reached when he mentions uh, the name of the author. And of course, we have to take into account the personality of the main character who was a difficult teenager. And uh, he lived in a, a, special, a special prison for um, adolescents. He did not uh, have uh, many, uh, he did not, did not show much diligence in his childhood. So there is a, a disparity when he mentions uh, uh, this classic of Russian literature. Uh, then he has, he has to remember what he has invented. And uh, first he mentions, he starts with a lofty register and then he uh, goes on to the reduced character and uh, uses such addresses as Yadya Pasha, Batyanya, 
and the other syntactical structures. I also want to point out that there can be a difference in the active nature of some uh, parameters and their creativity. Now, the parameter which I have mentioned, the change of social registers, is one of the main uh, one of the main uh, means used in the comedy Ivan Vasilievich Minet Professor stage. They using the uh, play by uh, Bulgakov. Uh, the uh, the main character uh, the main characters are not uh, adapted in communication and they make constant mistakes because uh, the social communicative registers are used in the wrong place. So the result is a comic effect. Uh, this approach on the whole and the method which is elaborated are uh, aimed at uh, uh, avoiding uh, the uh, separation in studying linguistic nature of uh, the fun functioning of the language and to uh, approach uh, the problem of uh, language creativity, taking into account uh, the compatibility of various language means uh, and uh, the conditions of uh, this uh, linguistic uh, um, uh, parameters and uh, their compatibility in the linguistic space. space. In our case, uh, uh, this is uh, the uh, cinema discourse. Further on, I would like also briefly to focus on the second approach, studying the creative possibilities of the language from the position of the creation of cinematographer um, means. So the main method here is uh, the polymodal uh, uh, measurement of the linguistic creativity. And uh, the main approaches here are uh, cinematographic metaphors, irony, and the sources of these methods are verbal units of various structural, semantic, and functional classes, such as words, set phrases, and so on. Uh, cinematography definitely has a language of its own in creating um, this phenomenon. This is the movement of the camera, and so on. But uh, at the conceptual level, the same fundamental laws are applied like in the natural language, like replacement of objects, uh, the identification of various uh, objects. One of the examples uh, which I can give here of uh, cinematograph metonymy is taken from the uh, episode from the Semyonik Seven Nurses film. And here we see that the change of the, uh, of, of, of the uh, film and the changing, uh, taking pictures from different angles in this film serve to, to Im increase the impression, impressionism and um, the affection rising from of the main character. His affection starts during the unexpected meeting with Anna. And though in uh, the uh, film, uh, there is no verbal explanation of this episode, but the expression uh, this ex this episode is uh, directly connected uh, with the phrase love at first sight. And uh, this is uh, easily reconstructed with the help of the verbal description, which makes it possible to speak about another possibility of the language to create uh, uh, verbal uh, metaphors. One of the uh, most frequent uh, means here is uh, the cinema metaphor and uh, that is uh, that, uh, that derives on our study of uh, uh, comedies one of the central uh, concepts here is the concept that uh, linguistic creativity in uh, the comedy cinema discourse is the result of cinematograph performation which is understood as staging or a screening and we can remember here uh, the previous uh, quotation, which I used as the introduction to my speech. And uh, this uh, uh, changing of the format is understood as using the verbal units, for example, words or metaphors, uh, uh, word combinations, uh, phraseologism. As a result of this, a uh, complicated new, uh, complicated polymodal uh, creation is born cinematographic, cinematographic uh, metaphor. How it happens, like phraseological unit as an example, we can use uh, the phraseologism uh, to hurt somebody, 
to help somebody from the film Добро пожаловать Элен Климов. So we see in these pictures, the first pictures, the beginning of the film. This is the view of Kostya Irochkin, who is under the rostrum, and he hears how two team leaders discuss him, and one of them pronounces the words or the phrase that Kostya Ivochkin um, spoiled the blood of the uh, camp director. Spoiled the blood means to hurt. And uh, this spoiled the blood is a kind of trigger which gives birth to a developed cinematographic metaphor. He imagines himself with his children's imagination how it can happen. And in the second episode, we see a doctor who finds volunteers to save the life of the director of the camp. And they're supposed to, to donate their blood but uh, his blood uh, group is very rare, 33, group 33, and only one person has uh, this group of blood, uh, Kostya Ivalgin uh, himself. And uh, then uh, the director who expelled him from the camp, as a matter of fact, uh, but uh, Kostya decides uh, to sacrifice himself uh, for his sake. And uh, in the next picture, we see how it is happening. Uh, there is a blood uh, transfusion, and Kostya Ivochkin uh, donates his blood to the camp director. So this uh, transformation of the phraseological metaphor, phraseological unit in this uh, film is shown in this episode. Uh, the cinematographic uh, metaphor transforms uh, the uh, verbal unit and uh, uses uh, unique uh, parameters to do that. And uh, that is another example of uh, um, this method in the films. So there is a dual process underway. On the one hand, the, phraseolo uh, the phraseologism creates a new situation. And on the other hand, it is subjected itself to a certain semantic uh, transformation. Uh, do we analyze uh, this cinematographic uh, change? Uh, and also, we also identified here several parameters which make it possible how the verbal uh, unit is used. First of all, it's presentation of this unit in the uh, film, whether it is pronounced or written. Maybe it, maybe it is pronounced and uh, uh, written or maybe not pronounced and not written. The second parameter is the length of the cinematographic staging of the uh, initial verbal unit. And the metaphor about saving the camp director uh, lasted two minutes. So it took, uh, took up 10 minutes in the film. The third important parameter is the general verbal structure of the cinema cinematographic uh, metaphor and all verbal means which are involved in creating this metaphor. The next is the visual range. This is the description of the scene, the, cha the, the time, the place, the, um, uh, the, the, the characters, uh, the movement of the camera. Next is uh, the sound line, which is also important. Uh, it's important to take this into account uh, in the transformation of the musical units, uh, like uh, musical accompaniment, various uh, sounds and noises. And another important uh, para parameter is uh, the kinetic a range of uh, the uh, senior metaphor. And uh, here we analyze a wide range of various modalities related to the uh, acting of the actors, how they move, um, how they gesture and so on. So the demonstration of the difference uh, functioning of these uh, um, uh, modalities, I would like to demonstrate this with the staging of um, uh, uh, novels. I mentioned uh, Tolstoy today. Now I would like to uh, use his novel, uh, Iva, uh, Anna Karenina, and one of the key metaphors in this novel to show the different uh, staging, staging of how they can be different, uh, how the staging can be different, because uh, uh, linguistic creativity can be uh, practiced in different ways. 
and uh, how the uh, the metaphors can differ in different uh, in different films, and uh, the parameters can be used in a different uh, manner. So here I mean uh, the literary metaphor to blow out the candle, or the candle uh, goes out, and two uh, screenings of uh, this novel, one in 1997 and 2012. So the first one by Bernard Rose, the main character uh, was played by Sophie Marceau. And uh, the distinguishing feature of uh, the literary metaphor in the framework of this screening is that it, uh, we come across it in two episodes. The first is uh, Anna Karenina's dream. We see it in the first picture. She's falling asleep. She's looking at the candle, which is still burning. In her dream, she sees what's going to happen to her in the near future, that she will be run over by the train. And the next, uh, then the camera looks to the candle, which uh, goes out. And uh, an interesting association here, the smoke of the uh, train and uh, the smoke of the candle when it goes out. The next episode is, uh, this, is the screening uh, this is the tragedy itself of Anna Karenina. We see how she stands in, uh, in, before the train, uh, seeing uh, her whole life um, in her imagination. Then we see the tragedy itself, which is shown in a rather uh, detached way. Uh, the smoke, the steam, and we see the uh, candle which has gone out. There is a different approach to the screening and linguistic metaphor by Joe Wright and uh, Kira Knightley in the main role. And uh, there's only one uh, final episode where this metaphor is used. We again see Anna Karenina, she is on the verge of a suicide. Uh, then uh, the camera focuses on her uh, face which demonstrates her last emotions, emotions in the last minutes of her life. In uh, uh, this director's interpretation, uh, the la her last uh, thoughts are about uh, Count Vronsky. And then we see how Anna Karenina is uh, in this form re resembles a, a candle which has gone out. And you can see her face and the screen, which is darker. And the, uh, this metaphor is enhanced. So we can see how in two different screened, uh, screenings of the novel, uh, either the literalization of a uh, literature metaphor takes place or the metaphoric nature of the uh, language unit of the language drop is enhanced. In one case, uh, a person as the light that goes out, the candle that goes out, and the life of a person which also um, gives out and comes to an end. Uh, so this uh, comparison uh, of the two uh, elements. And I'm now approaching the end of my presentation. And in conclusion, I would like to say the following. One of the factors which enhances interest in the cinematic uh, discourse is uh, that verbal and nonverbal metaphorical uh, means and cinematic tropes are now used. Uh, well, is actually growing. The trend is on the rise. And uh, it uh, enhances the impact that the film has on the viewers, on people coming to the cinema. And uh, the interaction of this uh, poetic um, metaphor uh, and its combination with different other aspects, political advertising and others, uh, also is quite important. And of course, we have to reflect on how the um, language uh, interacts and uh, is congruent with the metaphors which the cinematic language um, develops. And now I would like to thank you for your touch. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Irina Vladimirovna, for such an interesting uh, report, uh, for such an interesting presentation. I would like to remind the participants in the conference that they can fill in the Google form either on Google Tube, uh, on YouTube, or at the site of our conference. But there is already one question. Uh, in linguo stylistics and cognitive stylistics, uh, there is the notion of the convergence of stylistic um, techniques. Uh, which implies a whole range of stylistic techniques which are based on uh, the universal linguistic basis, which aim at creating a multi-component, but at the same time, um, uh, a single uh, metaphor and a single uh, technique in uh, creating an impact. Well, in uh, speaking about the cinema, can you speak about lingua cinematic tropes that are used in the same way can you single out uh, the combinations which are most widely used more often used thank you it's a very interesting question indeed such an analogy invites itself so to speak and cinematic tropes i think are a, uh, the emergence uh, of uh, new elements, elements of a higher level, and they uh, combine all the uh, properties of different systems, the uh, linguistic system and the cinematic one. And of course, they are very complicated. And in order to single out which uh, interrelations are most uh, commonly used, most frequently used, is not easy. Uh, and uh, sometimes they are just a single example, unique in its way, uh, but some typology, of course, uh, does exist. And on the one hand, uh, when we analyze it on the basis of certain properties, we can bring them into a system, but uh, also most of them are unique in themselves, which is actually the aim of film directors, I believe. And one more small question. Uh, uh, does a linguistic creativity discourse uh, and research into this field, uh, does it include the dialogues uh, uh, which are not uh, actually, uh, which are edited out of the film, where actors may be um, you know, extemporizing, playing impromptu. Yes, it's again a very interesting question. And in this case, we uh, suggested that uh, all the verbal elements that are in the film should be uh, analyzed. Uh, well, um, actually taking outside, uh, excluding uh, what took place uh, uh, during the filming uh, process, which is interesting in itself. But in our work, we focused on the final product where all the additional uh, properties are already taken um, well outside the final product when, uh, of course, uh, you can analyze what suggestions actors were making, what um, uh, the, 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 the new turns, uh, what techniques, what uh, uh, the methods they were suggesting, but which were not accepted in the final count. And my question, uh, well, also my last question, why did you take uh, Soviet comedies rather than modern comedies? Well, I, uh, I can say that we are also doing research on modern comedies, but I think the history of our uh, cinematography uh, played its role because the films I have focused on are masterpieces of the time. And it was very interesting to um, analyze this linguistic creativity and analyze how it was changing from the 1960s to the uh, latest uh, comedies. And 
um, the material does include modern comedies as well. Uh, not the ones I presented in my uh, presentation today. Uh, you simply can't put everything into one presentation. Thank you. Uh, and I don't know how relevant it is for uh, the cinematic uh, discourse, but how uh, our uh, participants are asking, how can you uh, study the metaphorical aspect of uh, uh, Latin maxims. Uh, well, I think this is also a very interesting field for research. And if uh, they are reflected in uh, our modern discourse, uh, of course, it is instantiated in new forms and uh, in modern formats. And the author needs it for something. There must be a purpose it serves. Uh, some pragmatic uh, aims which it uh, serves and means. Uh, thank you very much. So far, we have exhausted the questions. Maybe there will be more questions, uh, and then we shall uh, transfer them to you. I'm uh, thanking uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Zikova for a very interesting presentation. And now we are going to the second presentation. Uh, Professor uh, Heather Lotherington, a professor at, of the University of York at the Canadian city of Toronto, who uh, has devoted about 40 years to uh, the issues of teaching and learning languages, who has worked with uh, learners all over the world. And Dr. Lothering, uh, Lotheringen uh, heads um, the group studying the techniques of uh, learning the digital uh, techniques of uh, teaching the language, of learning the language. So she will be speaking about digital communication today, uh, the development, uh, the, the language, digital mediation, and academic writing. Uh, you have the floor here, uh, Professor Lotherington. Professor, switch on the mic. We can't hear you. Hear me now. Yes. yes. Okay, that's funny. Okay, let me leave that off. We have a difficulty there. Thank you very much. Now I know you can hear me. I'm just going to find out if you can actually see me. Well, not me exactly, but my presentation. So is this coming? To you, okay. Yes? I can't hear anything. Can you see? That, that's possible. Yeah, okay, good. All yes, right. Yes, we can see it. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Uh, right, let me jump into it. We have a half hour. Good afternoon to you. It's good morning here. It's 10 to 9 in the morning. Uh, so I realize I'm your last, uh, the caboose, as it were, of the conference today. Uh, and I start my morning with your last uh, presentation. So um, I'm going to begin just by a quick acknowledgement that the work that I present to you has been funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And I'm grateful for the money. We can't do our research if we don't have research funding. And I work with other people. So in the, the little snapshot below, uh, in the bottom corner, you have my co-researcher, Kurt Thumler, and some of his work is, is very important to the thinking we're doing, and our two research assistants who are really important to the thinking that we do on this. So I'm going to start with the central premise that what we are teaching, and this really, I, I'm not going to be so chauvinistic that I assume this is anything other than the world of language teaching I know about. So I'm speaking specifically about English language teaching and peripherally about French language teaching. And you must draw your conclusions as you see fit. And I'd be grateful for hearing from you on similarities and differences. But the very first thing to say here is that we are out of step that on the left, you have the 20th century forms that govern how language is taught. 
but how we use language is on the other side of the page. There we have, uh, for instance, I've got a Twitter novel. I have, that's from The Guardian. And I have a little page out of uh, my Facebook feed. And we have multimodality, we have tweet grammars, we have new lexical grammatical conventions. And I'm not seeing any of this taught and I don't know why. So I have decided to take some very basic terms in language linguistics and language teaching and kind of organize my thoughts around these very, very, very sort of basic terms. And we start with the question, what is language? So language is treated as an abstract structure in all of modern, and by modern, I mean modern. I'm looking at what we're doing as postmodern. Modern thinking, modern language teaching that still governs a great deal of what we do. Now, I mean, this is how we have archived our thoughts for a millennium. So we have to know how to work with language as it was mediated in books, pre-digitally. We have to know how to do that, there's no question. But that is no longer enough. So we have to think also about language as a semiotic resource, which I think resonates very nicely with the previous talk where that was very much uh, the, the, the kind of central premise. And that is very much where we are right now, although we've moved past that a little bit as well, which we'll get to in a second. And when we think about how we've had waves of socio-technical change moving through web 1.0, electronic bulletin board, to web 2.0, where we've got a kind of net of people and social communications, we jump very nicely into how this is theorized by a lot of social semiotics theoreticians, like. Wintercrest, for instance, looking at multimodality, looking at uh, instead of writing, we're looking at uh, not linear processing, but multimodal design uh, and a number of features like that. So that's very definitely something that we have to think about. But we also have to think about language as a social medium. Now I'm going to add in post-humanism, but before we get to post-humanism, Language is obviously a social medium. Uh, we are working across languages today. Uh, I found the previous talk very, very interesting and I would like to thank you very much. I would also, I'm sorry, I should have thanked the organizers right at the outset. I'm so appreciative of this opportunity. It's extremely interesting for me and I hope I can make this interesting for you. So this is a social medium. We use this as social glue between people in the 20th century, there was work done, and we'll see whether this will work for you or not. We had a few problems yesterday with using language with other animals. We are animals with other, but non-human animals, Those such as bonobos. Now, I'm not going to talk about talking with animals today, fascinating though that is, but that work, that post-human work was ongoing in our last century. This century, we really, really have to think about what's happening on the right. And I've used a French example. We're so used to doing that here. Basically, it says, this is Siri on my phone. It says, I speak a number of varieties of French, Belgian, Canadian, French of France, Swiss French, but I also speak a number of other languages and you can change the language you are using with me in the rules and regulations within the, the, the Siri you know, systems file. So we are increasingly using language as a social media with non-humans and with mechanical non-humans and with algorithms and with machines. This is not good, bad or indifferent. It's not a value statement, it's an observation. So the way language is organized in most of the textbooks that I happen across is for pre-digital mediation. So it was theorized during that time. There was an idea that you had books, you had uh, media that weren't interactive, such as cinema, 
uh, and you had direction, you had uh, recordings and things like that, but they were unidirectional. So they, they weren't interactional. The skills appropriate to that were speaking, listening, reading, and writing. Okay, fair enough. However, this is where we are now. And this is really just a, a kind of brief indication of where we are. It's not exhaustive. So we have moved out of those first two columns into the three columns. And we've moved from one of those columns sequentially through one, two, to three. We're in a period right now where the kind of mediation we have in which we must theorize language looks like this. So I think, I feel very strongly that we've got to think very differently about the tools we have, the grammars we have, the kind of nature and fabric of language we're working with and what we can do with that. The skills start to look very different too. Digital skills started long before we hit the interactive and public web. Those of us who are academics uh, and who are around to see films in the era that was just described, uh, we've been on email for, I mean, decades and decades long before the public web. But the public web in 1991 was the big game changer. Many people listening to that will not have much recognition of that period because you would have been born during a time when this was already happening. And I think teachers have come to grips with a lot of the read write web in web 2.0, but I don't think we're doing a very good job of acknowledging where we're going in web 3.0. So my mission today is to sort of take a look at uh, bit by bit, some of the changes that have occurred in language, the way we see it used, and to ask you, like all language specialists and educators, to think very carefully about this because we must make the changes. And if we don't make the changes, they're gonna be done for us by people who don't know what we know about language. That will sound a little less cryptic as I get going. First, a word on technology. Um, I don't know what you think technology is and what common perceptions are of technology. But here I will say I'm very disappointed with what I hear from a lot of people because I often hear this idea that technology is something that looks like that, a smartphone that has processing power. But in fact, Technology is an incredibly complex system and the artifact, the technological artifact is only one part of that. So I've got a couple of quotes here today. I see I've covered my own screen again somehow, but uh, one is knowledge of the physical nature of a technical artifact, knowledge of its functional nature uh, and knowledge of the relationship between the physical and the functional natures. In other words, you have to have the scientific knowledge of the technology, the artifact itself. You have to have some sort of an artifact that can be used. And then you have to have some sort of use factor of it. And that's in a circle. So the use may change the design of the artifact because it may have been designed for something that it's not used for. And in fact, that is how language is changing online that users are developing conventions and these conventions then the developers look at and they say well i guess we'd better put that into the kind of core components of what we're doing and biker who is very interesting theorist dutch theorist says technologies do not merely assist in everyday lives they are also powerful forces acting to reshape human activities and their meanings so we have to keep this very much in mind. These are not neutral, benign artifacts that come out of some all-knowing, all-being source. And then we just pick up and do. That is a recipe for disaster. And yet I see that every day in really bad language apps. So we have this kind of, you know, person and machine kind of dyadic interrelationship here. What is your relationship with the technology you are using? 
Um, a lot of people are very reductive uh, about how they use technologies. And that is, becomes a kind of void in the marketplace that is filled very quickly with commercial language apps that are extremely poorly uh, created, extremely poorly done. Uh, but you have many uses who are extremely uh, good with being able to use technologies for their purposes. And this is what we're angling for. We have to angle for being on top of the technology because at its heart, it looks like this. If you have a pencil in your hand and you write something, there is no inherent logic in the pencil. The pencil has got no inherent abilities whatsoever. It comes out of your head through the technology of the pencil onto a paper. Hammer, same thing, no ability, hammer's not gonna do anything. It is not going to build your house. But if you take a look at the picture on the top and you're gonna think I'm very silly for saying this, but I am gonna say it, that is a technology well used. It is not very sophisticated, true enough, but it's a technology well used. This is an adolescent using her smartphone to take a selfie, obviously her Salvador Dali moment, and then she will do something with the picture she creates. She uses the technology to do something. Now that is in contrast to the slide just, or the, the image just below, which is uh, just a screen grab from Duolingo, which is a program that is created by a developer for money, for users, not by teachers, for learners, for learning. And it will box you into a program and take your data if you are not on top of what you're doing. So we're gonna put you on top of what you're doing. We move to the idea of grammar, where if you take a look at uh, tweet grammars, for instance, text grammars as well, you will find that how grammars are organized in our modern ways of thinking in terms of sentences, words, punctuation, none of that will generate the kind of uh, output you need to generate to be part of this community, none of that. So we really truly have to think about developing grammars for media environments. We have to think about that. In Twitter, we have um, lots and lots of changes. Instead of words, you have characters that generate the length of a text. The, the era of the short attention span, I fear very much, nonetheless, with these short texts, which are an important part of our textual world, that's what happens. Also, we have what we used to think of as punctuation used in very different ways. So the at sign takes on a life of its own. We'll talk about that in the next slide. And the hashtag, extremely interesting what happens with the hashtag. If you take a look at the menu, you don't have to look at this slide. This is just a grab off of a, I'm very interested in dance. I figured that was pretty neutral kind of topic I could put on here. Uh, you will see an iconic navigation panel. So, uh, and above as well. So you have icons that actually move your grammatical uh, activities. So these are extremely new ways of thinking about grammar and we have to be aware of this. When we come to vocabulary, I think it's even more fun myself. Um, I have always loved the question, what is a word? Uh, I, I think it's a really, really interesting question. Um, I guess that's why I'm a linguist, because I think that's an interesting question. Um, but it is particularly interesting here, because in new grammatical environments, and with the tools we have in our phones, in our, our mobile devices, which are extremely powerful, you have to remember your smartphone has got the same sort of um, capacities in terms of what it can do, what it can assist you in doing as the supercomputers of the 90s. You know, I mean, that's a frightening thought, um, but there it is. So we were just speaking of the new lexical grammatical symbols such as hashtags, which uh, I mean, they're fascinating tagging devices. Um, they were, they, they came out of Twitter uh, with the intention to organize content. 
Um, this is a user developed convention that was then adopted by the developers in, and designers within Twitter. And it has now escaped the borders of Twitter and is used uh, even in print domains in front of headlines and newspapers. So um, I find hashtags really very interesting in their use. The at sign, um, uh, I've been reading some very interesting things about performatives, at signs, um, now indicate, of course, addresses, mentions as well. And so in the sense of a mention in, in a, a, a tweet, you have something that's actually a directive, which is starts to take on really new and interesting powers within one little symbol. Um, there's another thing I want to mention about the hashtag. Uh, English, which is the language that I know best of the languages I know, um, is uh, basically, basically an analytical sort of a, a, a grammar. And that's because the days of its synthetic roots were kind of simplified out of it through creolization, basically sort of processes. Um, and so, you know, it's, as you know, because many of you know English, you teach English, you're specialists, many of you, you know, when you take a look at Russian with its very sort of, uh, uh, its case grammar and the, the complexity of the synthetic nature of it, um, English grammar must always look terribly simple to you. The grammatical form of a hashtag is agglutinative, and that, across, that goes across languages. Now, agglutinative languages, we, we have. In, in Canada, we have agglutinative languages because a lot of indigenous languages have agglutinative grammars. And I actually conferred with a colleague of mine who's Anishinaabe, uh, that's Ojibwe or Chippewa, that group of, um, of native peoples. And I, I worked with him on this because I wasn't sure I was understanding it correctly, but it's basically the same kind of grammar you would use in Inuktitut Ojibwe and a number of indigenous languages here. It has a lot of flexibility within it. So within this analytical language of English, you have an agglutinative form and that does not change. Uh, you have medial caps or not. Uh, you certainly have no spaces, that is for sure. And you can also superimpose other digital conventions like all caps for shouting. Um, really very interesting. Let me move on, we haven't got all day. Um, so we talked yesterday about emoji and we did some work with emoji that now have an entire keyboard to themselves and are used and sprinkled throughout conversation everywhere. They're cross-linguistic devices in a sense like hashtags. Hashtags can also be plurilingual. Um, they can be full words, they can be short words. They, they're really fascinating constructions. Uh, emoji functioned very nicely. Oh, uh, I beg your pardon, I did that accidentally. There we go. Um, I have a keyboard, I have two keyboards underneath me and I just leaned on it, sorry about that. So emoji can function very interesting cross-linguistically and they can be used in lots of text to sort of help people get meaning across. Digital performatives I'm finding very fascinating. So words in uh, English, for instance, like like, share, pin, which are, you know, I like chocolate. Yeah, well, good for you. In terms of what they do in digital performance, like me, that is an economic statement. That changes algorithms. So we have really powerful digital performatives coming out. And the last one that I'll very briefly make name, and now I can actually turn the page, uh, is the selfie. Um, and I'm looking at the selfie within a kind of multimodal grammar that moves beyond web 2.0 and starts to move into, starts to move a little bit beyond the social semiotic theorizations. And here I'm actually going to lean on people from film and cinema in terms of their ways of capturing media. And here I'm, I'm using the theories of Lars Ellström, um, who has an inter-art uh, media paradigm uh, called intermediality, in which he characterizes media in terms of four modalities. So that I find that much, much more precise than social semiotic uh, characterizations of modality. 
material, spatial, temporal, sensorial, and semiotic. Well, semiotic, we, we have that under wraps, so it's fine. Um, spatial temporal has become extremely interesting. And that happens in a number of different ways. And in this way, I'm going to show you a simple selfie. And there I am. I'm with two school, school friends, old school friends. We have known each other for over 50 years. We've been friends, really three old girls. And we have been to, this is Montreal. We have been to an exhibit of Leonard Cohen's life. Leonard Cohen was a singer who uh, died a few years back and who was originally from Montreal. This is his hometown. And in fact, that's his house, except we didn't get a very good shot of it. In this museum exhibit, he's a much loved um, person about town because he, he often went back to Montreal actually. And he lived not in some elegant part of the city, but in the Portuguese neighborhood, you know, full of laborers and things like that. And um, he kept a house there. And there was a picture of him sitting in a bench across from his house in this exhibit. So after we went, we went out for lunch, and then we thought we'd take ourselves to this place and duplicate this, this selfie and sat ourselves down, try to figure out how to get Leonard Cohen's house behind us. So this becomes an example of a little text in space and time. You tell it's winter, something you're very familiar with in Russia. <laughs> And we missed, we, in expert in trying to get three people in, we instead got part of the neighbor's garage, which had an ad for the Azores, which are Portuguese islands that are a five hour flight from here. Um, and so it becomes uh, fixed in time, uh, fixed in an event, another event, fixed in what it, 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 it emulates in terms of what we were attempting to achieve and then we reinsert it into things and we have something that gives you a great deal of spatial temporal depth in an otherwise flat text. There's another way too where we're finding spatial temporality encoded in textual conversations. And we are finding a mixture of uh, spatially oriented text and temporally oriented text in the same conversation. So this is with GIFs, live photos and so on and so forth. So we have something like this so how did it go the other day? Here's the response. That bad. And that's the conversation. Uh, right, so let me move into the really truly sort of um, eerie stuff. And this is into the post-human communication. Uh, we are playing around with the ideas of digital immersion, seeing what we can do with um, the digital help assistance. We have the conversational voice of activated help assistance in our phones and in games and in other places to see what we can do to maximize language learning opportunities. Well, the answer is so far not that much, but these are data banks, right? They are not, there's not artificial intelligence here. The artificial intelligence starts to show up in some of the algorithmic change that happens in, in, in using these programs. Um, but we, you can set the language to what you want. So I set mine to French and began to have conversations with Siri in French. And we, we found a number of limitations trying to do this because it's a help program. So it will help you with um, very short requests and so on and so forth, but you can't create any kind of conversation out of it. Nonetheless, you can set your system to the language so that anytime you have a real question, it has, and you wish to find out some information, you have to formulate it in the language. So it has that. But they attempt to make these non human um, programs sort of culturally appropriate, which is really sort of strange. So Siri has a sort of as it were, ironic personality, which you can see when I asked an existential question of Siri and got back, you know, some very kind of silly um, remarks because of course this is, what is the meaning of life is not something that you ask a health assistant. And so um, one, of my, one of my colleagues went right down an alley in trying to sort of see how far he could push Siri into a conversation. And, you know, we're finding lots of limitations. We are still though looking at how we can start to use some of these um, electronic kind of programs that invade our lives 
for our purposes rather than for the purposes of the designers of the programs. Now, I did want to give a word to the wise about a disruptive innovation, which is the language uh, app. Uh, and as I mentioned before, these are designed by software developers and the pedagogies are ancient, dated, uh, behavioristic, boring, lockstep, uh, dreadful. I mean, just take a look at some of these slides and you get a sense of how poor the quality is. They gamify them so they can keep you in the app. That's so they can make money off of you and mine your data. So this is an example of what you really don't wanna be doing when you say you're working with technology. You do not want technology to be using you. You want to be using the technology. So let me go to the very last one now. And that is just to take up the idea of pedagogies. And I don't want to oversimplify the technology pedagogy interrelationship, it is a very complex one, but I'm gonna do my best at least to have you think about it um, in terms of what we've just been talking about. So we, you can hold on to the past by teaching language structurally, recognizing traditional language skills, relying on print assignments, academic essays. I haven't given an essay for 20 years. Uh, administering gatekeeping, that I can't avoid, standardized tests and defaulting to 20th century norms. This is right, this is wrong. You can do that, you know, and that'll hold us in the past. The book I show you at the right was written in 1939. The fact that it's relevant today is scary and it's mocking people who don't want to move on pedagogically. So we looked yesterday, this is an academic text that we looked at. We can, we can look at moving into the future and for this you'll need to refer to the workshop that I did yesterday by encouraging agent of learning with production pedagogies, integrating professional practices for real world, not just academic world purposes, exploring issues that are really of importance uh, and salience to the learner uh, using the digital tools that work for you. So it doesn't matter what the tools are, they just have to work for you and what you want to do. Uh, using all useful semiotic resources, including selfies, for multimodal, plurilingual production, because language too, in its different forms, is a semiotic modality. You can add different languages to, to layer the modality. You can call on AI um, and, and human support in meaning making. We make all our learning collaborative and you have to really be sure that the digital technology supports the production, doesn't control it. That's, that's of the utmost importance. We have other assignments that we, we give. Uh, I've given just a, a picture of a branching story or a, a gaming sort of game producer, game maker. Linguistic landscapes that we've done, fun mapping projects. Um, and just to sort of run through this, this is a little conclusion to how all of these things have sort of been reshaped through digital mediation. So language is still structurally identifiable. Russian is Russian, English is English, but it is socially shared now across post-human, the post-human spectrum. And it is very definitely a semiotic resource working with many in multimodal texts. Uh, technology is a socio-technical interaction. The learner is the agent in the work we're doing, the kind of pedagogical work we're doing. The learner is the agent, not the recipient. Um, technology can be designed to facilitate or control, so you have to be aware of technical inflexibilities and algorithmic control and work around them. You work with the tool, the tool doesn't work you. Um, media does affect, mediation affects language and substance and use. Um, we have moved through a whole series of affordances. They really augment creative license. There's much good in that as well. Uh, grammar, I think we need to teach in terms of being sensitive to media environments. Of course, you don't have to teach hashtags. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that you can use them in what you're doing. You can invoke all of those conventions because they will be understood from language to language and differences can then be examined. Um, we have really modally expanded um, spatiotemporal remixes and the kind of text we're creating. 
Uh, we, we do have to watch the fact that new grammars are often user constructed, which means that they're not as stable, but it also makes them, it, they're no less valid than past literary uh, resources, which is what we always relied on, you know, the work of someone who died long ago, it's already in a prestigious position for being published. We have new kinds of vocabulary. We have novel lexical, grammatical, and pragmatic constructions. They change how language is used and when it's used in those ways. Uh, we have uh, iconic information that would not normally be considered linguistic, but I have to put it into current communication because it can so help in creating meaning uh, for people whose languages are, are not of the same sort of degree of competency. You can really help people that way. The design potentials in, in text is vast these days. We really have to be exploratory and to have fun with what we have. And we have to remember that pedagogies really now need to be generated um, and, and to use real world concerns um, learner kind of agency and authority. They can be as collaborative as possible and you can use post-human assistance in the creation of your text. I better get off the stage. I have references, I'm gonna flash through them. And this is where I relied on a little machine technology to help me. So thank you very much. Spasiba, how's that? There we go. Um, thank you very much, Heather, for a very uh, comprehensive and convincing uh, report about the processes going on in the language, which are changing communication and have changed it to a great extent. We are communicating differently now, and we already have several questions from our participants, maybe not very easy ones. To what extent uh, the new approaches that you are speaking of uh, solve the tasks of higher education when students have to be able to work with a large mass of uh, scholarly literature, including uh, literature in the foreign language, and how uh, can you help them to formulate their ideas convincingly clearly if you suggest that we should give up such formats as writing summaries, uh, abstracts, um, essays, which in their own way are also effective. Thank you. Right. No, you don't give them up. You can't give them up. You know that Right. Uh, uh, For some reason, I'm hearing the Russian. I don't know why. I have English on. Anyhow, you can't give them up. They are part of what you do. I understand that, but I don't think they're enough. So I, I, I buy what you're saying. I buy what you're saying. We push against a very big system change. I, I understand that. That's really not any different here. I also understand that you've got people who are living in a, a large country in which you have a world language uh, governing the speech of, of people. And so therefore this is an intrusive as it were language that has to be looked at without easy access to populations that might speak it. That is a different situation from the one I live in. In Toronto, a whole lot of languages are spoken and it is not a difficulty to find someone to speak Polish with you, Italian, Arabic, uh, you'll be able to find them without any problem at all. So I understand that you're reading scholarly literature and you're working with that. I would convince you, I think, hopefully, or suggest anyhow to you, to think about a different kind of output. Yeah, sure, notes are good, essays are good. I, I, I do myself like novels and very well-constructed essays. It's been a long time since I've seen a well-constructed essay, unfortunately. But I think that that is not the sum total. So whereas in very literary study, you're, you're correct. My colleague Kurt does work in literary work and he has amazing digital outputs that he uses. 
Um, the last thing I will say in answer to it, I mean, it's a very challenging question and, and I acknowledge that this, the circumstances are difficult is I would have students work collaboratively. I would ensure that they're working collaboratively because the old days of everything is contained in one single head, oh, they're gone, they are gone. So that might be one thing that would help in this situation. Спасибо. Uh, еще вопрос. Что Thank практи... you. There's another question. Uh, from the practical viewpoint, what does grammar, practical grammar mean for those who are teaching uh, grammar? Well, can you integrate some of the novelties and innovations that you have been speaking about uh, into the traditional course of grammar? I would, I would take a look at language and take samples from different venues. Now it depends what level of language you're working with. You, I don't know. I mean, you could be working with people who are extremely proficient. You could be working with people who are beginners. So there will be different needs for people. And also, will they all be urban learners or will they be rural as well? So the conditions vary. The more disconnected from society a person is, the more they must rely on digital resources. So uh, I would take samples from different places so that you can use different samples of language. I, I see again and again tests here. I, I don't know about your context, but I see again and again tests that test people on grammar that's formulaic for English that I haven't heard anybody use in, I don't know, 30 years. An example would be the subjective use of pronouns. Pronouns are difficult in this day and age, anyhow, of trans people and so on and so forth. So subjectivity and how it's encoded would typically be uh, uh, Joe and I do this. But I haven't heard anybody use that in so long that I don't think I even use it myself. And yet I see it again and again and again on tests. What my daughter says, what everybody says, what my students say, even though they tell me they don't, is me and Jill are going to this, whatever. And, and so, I mean, there are a number of things there that are difficult to deal with. One is learning sort of formulaic grammar that people actually don't use. Um, and I know that's a problem in a number of languages. Um, the second one is making sure that you don't ignore texts that have digital origins, because that is how we communicate. And the more we look at only scholarly texts, the more we become distanced from the society in which we live. And at some point, I, I really have to pull us, I don't live in the ivory tower myself. I work with everyday language, everyday people, everyday students. But I can appreciate that working with very refined uh, historical literature or something is not so every day. Uh, I don't know if I helped you there, but I think I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, what is your opinion? if we uh, uh, decide to uh, gear ourselves to some simplifications, simplified grammar, almost the absence of punctuation marks, uh, some words which uh, people uh, simply are too lazy to use, too lazy to write. Does it mean that we shall uh, arrive at uh, something that George Orwell described in uh, his uh, uh, 1984, uh, uh, when some kind of new speak emerges, uh, so as to avoid the situation uh, which we have in um, the environmental uh, sciences, when after the industrialization, active in this industrialization, we ended up having polluted the environment, and now we have to deal with these issues. What a wonderful question, George Orwell, 1984. 
I wish our students were as literary as you are. I really do. Um, I, I just go back to uh, grammar. Uh, no, uh, I began my career looking at simplified grammar. My my real academic career, I wrote a master's and a doctoral thesis on simplified English in the 1980s, a very long time ago. And the problem is, is if you simplify one part of language, you, you load some other part of language. So if you pull to pieces um, grammatical technicalities that, that are, are awkward to deal with, you offload onto some other kind of inferential meaning. So I'm not a fan of simplification. I don't normally look at text grammars and tweet grammars as um, deliberately grammatically simplifying. I look at them as conventions that have come about through spatial demand because there's only so much space. The reason why tweets are, they're now 280 characters. The reason why they are is because they were modeled on um, texts and texts had to fit the first rudimentary phones. And so there were, you know, there were literally physical constraints. Um, so I'm not a fan of, of just, um, you know, of not having a grammatical understanding. I'm completely understanding because I speak other languages myself. I'm completely understanding of the difficulties of moving from one system of grammatical organization to another. And that is the difficulty, of course. Grammar is just the backbone of language on which the stuff that makes meaning is hung. And it's hung differently in digital environments. I think that's all I, I can say. So in terms of if you're gonna write a text, you have to write a text. You know, I mean, if you're going to write in print with paper and pencil, then that's what you do. You use that sort of grammatical structure. If you're going to write a tweet, you write it with a tweet grammar. It's media dependent. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much, Heather for your presentation, for uh, your answers to our questions. If more questions emerge, uh, we shall send them to you. We shall, uh, well, ask you these questions. But now, since we have very little time left, the time uh, is running out, and we would like to sum up some of the things. And I would like to say that the issues of linguistic studies and didactics, which we discussed both in our workshops and uh, at the plenary uh, meetings, they reflect the changes which are taking place in the language and in the teaching uh, very closely. And the tasks which we as linguists and as pedagogues are solving and will be solving in the near future uh, are immense. And I think time will show how we shall cope with them. Uh, I would like to express my conviction that I'm sure that uh, we shall do everything uh, to help the people benefit from what we can teach them the people of the planet, uh, however highfalutin it may sound. And now I would like to give the floor to Dmitry Alexandrovich Krichkov, uh, the head of the organizing committee of our conference. Dear colleagues, uh, good evening. Our conference is coming to a close. I would like to start with a few technical comments. To begin with, the certificate of the participants in the conference is already uh, well downloaded onto the site. It is protected by the passwords. And we shall check how attentive you are in reading our mail. You will be able to download your certificate. If not, well, there may be problems. I know that some participants asked us 
to uh, download the recording of the uh, workshops that they were unable to attend. I think it will take some time, but they will all be downloaded in the section dealing with materials. Now, the next thing deals with publication, with publishing the materials of the conference. And again, I would like to ask you uh, to um, uh, put the finishing touches to them, uh, meeting all the requirements that we uh, have already acquainted you with. Uh, well, uh, please uh, well, uh, look at them with a critical um, uh, approach. Uh, if uh, something still is wrong, which will send them back to you, asking you to improve some of the things for them to meet the uh, technical requirements, but we can't uh, do it very often. By the end of the week, uh, we are going to do our best and send the certificates to you by the end of next week by post. And now I would like to start by thanking the School of Business and International Competences of our university, which helped us in organizing this conference. We are very grateful to the uh, uh, leadership of GIMO. Of course, a conference um, and online conference would have been impossible without the center of um, uh, IT uh, technologies and we have worked uh, with them uh, 24 hours, uh, seven days a week for some time. And the um, Office of the uh, Technological Support of our university has helped us. And of course, the uh, the television studio, thanks to which you see us. Many uh, workshops and the plenary meetings uh, were accompanied by interpretation, uh, simultaneous interpretation, thanks uh, to our colleagues from uh, English language department number one uh, for this. Uh, we uh, used for the first time our master's degree uh, students are learning simultaneous interpretation. They were working with their more experienced colleagues and I think they coped very well. And I would like to thank all my colleagues uh, from uh, the English language department number one um, for helping you to participate in the conference. And since it's already late in the day and it's Friday after, uh, it, it's Saturday after all, we shall have to uh, uh, think uh, about uh, the uh, strong points and the weaknesses. Some of the colleagues have shown uh, that some of the links didn't work. Probably something was wrong with the connection or with the settings, we have rechecked them. But what I can say now is that the discussion we were aiming at organizing uh, did take place. I have attended many meetings, many workshops. I saw how people were working and there was a debate. It was a lively debate. It was not simply someone uh, well, presenting his topic without uh, arousing any interest in the others. And we would like to ask you uh, to help us in analyzing what was uh, good and what was uh, somewhat wrong. So we oh yeah, are now receiving uh, our questionnaire with the request uh, to indicate what was good, what was not so good. Uh, your impressions are important. Now time to wind up. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks to our speakers, uh, to people who participated uh, in our sessions. I'm sure that uh, we'll meet again. The next uh, Magic of Innovation is supposed to be held in two, day, uh, ways, uh, two years in, 19, in 2023. Thank you very much. Goodbye.